Process control depends on the integrity of communication between instruments. Information travels through the loop in signals, which represents the value of the process variable or the output of the controller. These signals must be uninterrupted if the loop is to work properly. When an instrument transmits electrical signals, those signals are sent through conductors to other process instruments. In this presentation, you will learn about the connections required to keep electrical signals flowing reliably. All of the procedures described in this presentation are to be performed in accordance with OSHA standard 1910.147 covering the control and isolation of hazardous energy sources. At the completion of this course, you should be able to recognize the operating characteristics of different conductors, splices and cables, describe how to install electrical connections in instrumentation and control loop systems, trace an electrical signal, identify general safety concepts of intrinsic safety and intrinsically safe systems. You may be familiar with types of industrial wires and conductors. Solid conductor wires are solid metal, usually copper, covered by insulation. Stranded conductor wires are strands of metal twisted together and covered by insulation. These wires are more flexible than solid conductors. Shielded cable has a metal shield between the insulated conductors and outer jacket. The shields can be braided metal, stranded metal, or foil as shown here. A foil shield may have a drain wire to permit easy connections to ground. Coaxial cable is shielded cable that carries low voltage signals. In addition to a jacket and braided shield, coaxial cable has a dielectric, an insulation covering the conductor. The amount of current a conductor can carry is determined by its gauge or size. The wire gauge and voltage must be marked on the insulation. Voltage ratings are determined by the amount and type of insulation. When wires are spliced or connected, they should have the lowest possible resistance, good mechanical strength, and sufficient insulation. Although you should generally replace rather than splice a damaged wire, it may occasionally be necessary to connect two stranded wires together. One way is with a crimped splice connection. To make a crimped splice, choose the correct size connector and measure the length of the insulation to be removed by inserting the wire until it touches the edge of the metal tube inside. Strip the insulation at the mark. Insert the conductor into the connector until the remaining insulation butts up against the metal tube. Crimp the wire with a crimping tool. Then inspect the connection for any loose strands. Pull on the splice to ensure a good mechanical bond. Follow the same steps to splice the connecting wire to the other end. Although solid wires can be joined with these types of connectors, they may also be connected with in-line splices. When you prepare the wires, be sure to strip off enough insulation. After you score the insulation, pull the stripper back slightly to loosen it. Then insert the wire into the next largest slot and pull the rest of the insulation off. This will minimize damage to the conductor. Since these wires aren't connected, we can add insulation later when the wires are connected to a process. Slip on the insulation before the wires are joined. Cross the conductors near the center of the stripped portions. Pull them together with pliers. Bend each conductor four to five times around the other tightly to form a mechanically strong connection. When you have finished, clip off the excess wire and bend down the sharp edges. In-line splices require soldering to make them electrically sound and to keep them from pulling apart. Position the splice for soldering and attach heat sinks to protect the insulation. We're using a resin core solder for this splice, but it may not be used on all types of circuits. If you use other types of solder, you may need to apply flux to clean the wire and ensure a good bond. Tin the tip of the soldering iron to help transfer heat and prevent corrosion. Heat the wires and touch the solder to the connection. Cover the entire splice. When the connection is cool, Clean it and remove any excess flux if necessary. A good joint should be smooth and shiny with all surfaces covered by solder. The individual connectors should also be visible beneath the solder. Finally, insulate the soldered connection. 
Move the insulation up over the soldered splice. Heat the insulation until it shrinks tightly around the connection and you can see the contours of the splice. Solder connections can be insulated with electrical tape as well as with heat shrink insulation. Coaxial cable connections can be crimped, clamped, or soldered. In any type of connection, however, the cable must be properly prepared. Whatever method you use to strip the jacket, do it carefully. If you damage the metallic braided shield under the jacket, you will have to start over with a new piece of cable. Cut the shield to expose the dielectric. Then remove the specified amount of dielectric to expose the conductor and unbraid the shield. The cable we have prepared will be attached to a BNC crimp style connector. The connector assembly includes an extension pin that is crimped or soldered onto the conductor. This pin helps make electrical contact inside the body of the connector. The sleeve is crimped around the body after it is installed on the cable. To make a BNC crimped connection, insert the extension pin into a crimping tool, then insert the coaxial cable conductor into the pin and crimp it. As we mentioned earlier, this pin can also be soldered to the conductor. Check the crimp to make sure the extension pin is securely attached to the conductor. Slip the body of the connector over the extension pin and move the sleeve up over the body. The sleeve fits tightly and will press the shield down over the connector. Crimp the sleeve with the crimping tool, then inspect it to make sure it is well made. Conductors can of course be attached to terminals rather than other wires. Solid conductors can be attached directly to a terminal by bending the wire to fit around a screw to form a hook. Begin by stripping the correct size wire and making a bend in the strip portion just above the insulation. Place the hooked wire around the screw that will be used in the terminal. Mark a spot about three quarters of the way around the screw shaft, then trim off the excess. Face the hook on the terminal clockwise in the same direction you turn the screw, then tighten the connection securely. A stranded conductor isn't as easy to form into a hook, so crimped lugs are often used. Select a lug that fits the wire gauge. Also, the head of the lug should fit around the threads of the terminal screw and should lie flat between the partitions in the terminal block. Make a crimped lug connection the same way you would make a crimped splice. Insert the wire into the lug, mark it at the appropriate length, and strip the insulation. Then place the lug over the wire and crimp it. In a good connection, the strands of the conductor are just visible at the end of the lug. Tighten the screw securely to ensure good contact between the lug and the terminal. A stranded conductor can also be installed in compression terminals. In these connections, the strip conductor is inserted into a terminal beneath the screw. When the screw is tightened, a metal tube inside the terminal compresses the conductor to make electrical contact. Making good electrical splices and connections requires patience and skill, but if you take care when you're installing a connection, you will spend less time repairing it in the future. How long has it been like that? About 30 minutes. Doug, we got the 1A dust system vacuum reading high. Would you go out there and take a look at it? Sure, I'll check it out. Many process instruments are grounded to a facility's ground system. Most facilities use structural steel, a rod embedded in the earth, or other existing metal in the building to carry ground current to a power system ground. Some grounds are designed for safety. These may also be called equipment grounds. Others are designed to protect instruments from electrical noise in the environment. Many instruments have both types of grounds. Grounding provides a low resistance path for unwanted or transient electrical current. Safety grounds include ground wires or ground straps that provide the path for current flow between the instrument case and earth. The metal conductor of a safety ground should be a large enough gauge to carry the maximum current expected under fault conditions as well as normal conditions. When you're maintaining electrical equipment, make sure that the system is de-energized and locked and tagged out according to OSHA standards. Also remember that dirt, grease, or any other non-metal substance can add resistance and interfere with the ground path. Since it can add resistance, remove any paint around the connection by scraping or sanding or applying paint remover.
Also use a star washer on these surfaces. The serrated edges dig into the metal, ensuring a good contact. Place star washers on the top and bottom of the connection. Add a flat washer on top of the star washer for good electrical contact with a ground wire lug. Install the ground wire lug and a lock washer to keep the lug positioned. Add the nut and tighten the assembly firmly. A tight assembly makes a good electrical connection and has less chance of the assembly working loose. Always measure the resistance of any connection you have repaired or installed. A quick check with a multimeter could save you the trouble of isolating the system again to locate the faulty connection. After zeroing the multimeter, place one probe on the ground wire and the other on a known ground. Compare your resistance reading to facility specifications. Instrument grounds are also wires or straps. However, they are designed to protect instruments from electrical noise. Electronic instrument signals are low voltage and low current. As a result, they are easily distorted by electrical noise. For example, an instrument cable that passes near a high voltage alternating current motor may be distorted by electrical noise. When the distorted signal is received by the controller, the value it represents won't be accurate. So the controller's output won't be accurate either, and the final control element may take incorrect action. The entire process may be adversely affected simply because a signal cable wasn't grounded properly. Due to the physical layout of the plant's equipment, it is not always practical to avoid all electrical equipment when running signal wires, but it is a good idea to use shielded cable when signal wires pass near high-voltage equipment. The shield screens out noise that can affect the signal carried by the conductor. Shielded cables work properly only if they are grounded so that transient current can be drained off before it affects the signal. However, shields must be grounded only at one end, or they may create their own source of signal distortion. If a shield is grounded in more than one point, distortion could be caused by a difference in ground voltage potentials. This voltage difference could be large enough to create a current flow through the shield, producing an unintentional ground loop. Ground is considered to be zero potential, but factors such as weather or electrical equipment can alter the Earth's voltage potential. Any current flow in this ground loop could distort the transmitted signal. Facility wiring diagrams should indicate where the instrument grounds are to be connected. Follow these diagrams closely, since improper grounding might cause a ground loop. Like ground loops, poorly made connections between a wire and an instrument can distort signal transmission. The maintenance and repair caused by these connections can be reduced if some simple steps are followed during initial installation. Is that loop operational yet? No, they were running a new cable down there this morning. Well, I think I'll go out and see how close they are to being finished. Okay, that's a good idea. Okay. Here, a shielded two-conductor cable will be connected to a transmitter at this end and to a terminal block at the other. We will begin at the transmitter end. Before you strip the jacket from a cable, visually estimate the length you will need to make all the connections. Measure to the farthest terminal. Mark the point where the jacket will be stripped as well as the point where the cable will be cut. Cut the cable at the end mark and remove the jacket to expose the shield. Unwrap the drain wire and foil shield. Remember, either of these can be used as the instrument ground to shield the cable. Whichever is not used should be removed at both ends of the cable connection. We'll be using the drain wire as the shield at the terminal block end, so the foil can be clipped off here at the terminal block end. Fold back the excess drain wire and tape it to the cable. At this end, we've insulated the drain wire, which we will be using as ground at the terminal block end, rather than cut it off. Then attach lugs to both signal leads. Connect each to its proper terminal and tighten securely. Remember that lugs should be selected to fit the terminal screw as well as the size of the conductor. When the transmitter end is connected, Attach the other end to the appropriate terminal. Check the facility wiring diagram to determine where to attach the conductors. Regardless of the instrument you're working with, you will generally follow the same steps for making any connections. 
First, visually estimate the length of cable you will need. Mark the cable at two places, where it should be cut and where the jacket should be stripped. Once the cable is cut and the insulation is stripped to the correct length, unwrap the drain wire and pull back the foil shield. Remember, you remove the foil shield at the transmitter end, so you will need to remove it at this end as well. Keep in mind also that the drain wire will be grounded at this end. Expose and separate the conductors and drain wire so that you can attach lugs for making the connections. Once the proper size lugs have been attached, connect the conductors to the proper terminals according to the wiring diagram. Tighten all connections securely and label as required. Once the connections are made, the circuit is complete and the loop can be placed back into service. Problems in electronic instrument loops are caused in several ways, such as when a signal conductor contacts a ground source, when a conductor contacts a grounded shield, or when a ground loop results from grounding a shield at more than one point in the loop. To locate problems efficiently, first analyze the wiring diagram to familiarize yourself with the components. Then establish a logical way to trace the signal. This wiring diagram shows a flow transmitter connected to a two-conductor shielded signal cable in the field. A 4 to 20 milliamp signal passes through a junction box to terminals at the controller. Notice that the shield is grounded at the controller. The controller's output signal is sent through this junction box, then on to a transducer. The transducer converts the electrical signal to a pneumatic signal and sends it on to a control valve. So the electrical circuit ends at the transducer. Suppose operations finds that the valve is not responding. The input appears to be correct, but the output does not appear to be reaching the valve. Hey, Bobby. Yeah. You find anything wrong with that valve? No. But I still think we ought to have maintenance check it out. Okay, I'll give Doug a call. When you inspect a valve, look for any mechanical problems first. If the valve isn't receiving a pneumatic signal, the transducer is either malfunctioning or not receiving an electrical signal. If the transducer isn't receiving a signal, you may have a problem with the connections or wiring in the loop. One way to trace a signal is to check it at sequential termination points in the loop until you find the interruption. According to the diagram, the junction box is the next logical step in the signal path. Check the terminals at the junction box. If the connections and wiring appear sound but are not receiving a signal, move on to the connections at the controller terminals. If you still don't find a signal, check the controller's input terminals. If there is no signal to the controller, keep tracing through the circuit by checking terminals at the junction box and at the flow transmitter if necessary. The signal interruption must lie somewhere in the electrical path of this loop. You are likely to pinpoint the signal interruption as a loose connection, broken conductor, frayed wiring, or another common connection problem in one of the components, such as this junction box. Notice that one of the terminal connections on the panel has worked loose. To find out if this is causing the signal interruption, Tighten the connection and check it with a multimeter to make sure you have corrected the problem. Even in the most complex loops, signal tracing can be done quickly if you follow logical steps. Signal tracing can employ both voltage and current measurements, depending on the type of problem the system is experiencing. Even under normal operating conditions, electrical equipment can produce an arc when contacts make or break. And some types of electrical equipment, such as motors or generators, can create tremendous amounts of heat. In areas where flammable or combustible substances are stored, the arcing or heat produced by electrical equipment can be a source of ignition. It is important that you know where these locations are and why they are dangerous before working with the electrical or electronic instruments in those areas. The National Electrical Code has established classifications for the types of hazardous locations that are found at manufacturing plants, utilities, and similar facilities. The classification of the hazardous location is determined by the type of substance used or stored there. 
Be sure you're familiar with NEC guidelines before working on controls and instruments in hazardous areas. There are three classes of areas. Class 1 areas have flammable gases or vapors present. Class 2 areas have combustible dust present. Class 3 areas have ignitable fibers or flying is present. The National Electrical Code also divides locations according to whether or not they are dangerous under specified conditions. There are two divisions. Division 1 locations are hazardous under normal operating conditions. Division 2 locations only become hazardous when operating conditions are abnormal, such as during a power surge. Until such conditions occur, they are considered safe. Your facility may or may not have hazardous locations as described in the National Electrical Code. If such locations are present, you should become familiar with the classifications since they determine the type of work that can be done there. In addition, you should know whether the classifications are posted or whether you must check the wiring diagram and safety documentation to find out. Ordinary equipment that is not designed for use in hazardous locations can be made safe by adding housings, seals, or other devices. These devices are often used to prevent gases, vapors, or flames from passing through an electrical installation. There are three systems generally used to minimize the hazard of explosion. Explosion-proof housings, purge systems, and intrinsically safe systems. Explosion-proof housings are cast metal enclosures designed to prevent explosive gases from entering areas where they could be set off or to contain explosions if they occur. A purge system uses an enclosure filled with an inert gas at positive pressure to keep explosive gases from entering. An intrinsically safe system uses low-voltage power and specially designed wiring and instruments to minimize the risk of igniting explosive gases. Your facility may have other types of safety systems and procedures. Be sure to become familiar with them before working on any electrical equipment. Follow the necessary procedures for locking and tagging out the system and testing it before touching any surfaces that might possibly be energized. The importance of electrical connections can't be underestimated. Keep in mind that the operation of the process instruments and the safety of the personnel who work with them depend in part on the quality of the connections you make. This introduction to electrical connections will give you a foundation for working with the instruments in your facility. Remember, however, that designs and operational principles differ, so always follow the manufacturer's instructions and your facility's guidelines before working on any controlled instruments. Ordinary equipment that is not designed for use in hazardous locations, these devices are often used to prevent gases, vapors, or flames generally used from to passing. minimize the hazard of explosion. Explosion housings are cast metal enclosures designed to prevent explosive gas system uses an enclosure filled with an inert gas at power and specially designed wiring and instruments to minimize the risk any of electrical igniting equipment. Follow the necessary procedures for... The importance of electrical connections can't be underestimated. Personnel who work with them depend in part on the quality of the connections you make. For working with the instruments in your facility. Remember, so always follow the manufacturer's instructions and your...